I know what you're thinking. You're thinking whose life was so complete that he thought the only thing left to do was to create an episode about the history of... <sighs> the car headlights. Well, that would be me. Because welcome everyone to the 14th episode of the Automotive History series, where we are going to... <coughs> shine a light on the history of the car headlights. In the early 1900s, there was this new thing called an automobile, but quickly nicknamed the horseless or motorized carriage. And that's what it essentially was, a carryover from the horse-drawn carriage, but the horse was now replaced by an engine. But the rest around it stayed very much the same, including the lamps, or lights. In those days, it were simple candles that did the job of not necessarily letting you see in the dark, but at least be seen by everyone else. The daylight equivalent would be someone walking in front of your motor car, waving a flag and screaming A car is coming! A car is coming! Watch out everyone! The first car lamps were lanterns, fueled by oil or... <sighs> as, acet, acetylene... As, acetylene? Acetylene lean lun... Acetylene... Whatever. Which created a flame resistant to wind and rain but the stuff itself was rather explosive. Manufacturers quickly switched to electric headlights, but proved to be a bit troublesome at first. The filaments had a short life because of the harsh environment, and it was tough to create a dynamo that was small and powerful enough to power the lamps. Still, the electric headlamps improved rapidly, to name some developments. In 1912, Cadillac introduced the electric ignition so that you no longer had to get out of the car to turn on the lights. From now on, you could do it comfortably from the car's dashboard, as we are still used to by today. In 1924, a company introduced the concept of low and high beams within the same light bulb. Fog lamps saw the light, hee <laughs> hee, in 1938. And in 1954, it was once again Cadillac that introduced the Autronic Eye, which automatically switched between low and high beams depending on oncoming traffic. From the early 1900s all the way to the 1930s, car headlights stayed pretty much the same in design, shaped like a shell, attached to a metal bar, placed ahead of the grill. Some variation was possible, including shape like this, I have seriously no clue at what they call this, Headlights placed on top of the front fenders, like this 1930 Pierce Arrow. Headlights placed within the grille, like this 1938 Peugeot. And headlights hidden away, like the 1936 Quartz, the very first car to do this, but more on that later. In the 1940s, headlights moved from being a separate entity into being fully incorporated into the front fenders. It is at this point that the United States government decided that round headlights would be standardized and had to have a predetermined size, 7 inches in diameter. Europe, however, was still free to use whatever shape and size they liked, as long as it met basic requirements. In 1947, a innovative startup by the name of Tucker, like the late 40s version of Tesla, introduced the Tucker 48. Among other things, not worth discussing right now, the car had a third nipple, third headlight, which was connected to the steering wheel, effectively letting it turn left or right, depending on which way you would go, and letting you see what was going on around the corner. This idea wasn't entirely new, as the Czechoslovakian Tatra T77 played around it some 10 years before. But there was only one slight inconvenience. A third headlight was forbidden in 17 states of the states united. By 1957, American manufacturers were getting fed up with the strict rules and pleaded for a dual set of smaller size headlights. This led to the unique situation that a bunch of states allowed dual headlights in 57 and a bunch didn't. As a workaround, some car models had what from a distance looked like dual headlights, but up close turned out to be a standard headlight and a smaller parking light next to it. By 1958, after constant nagging, dual headlights were finally allowed and led to interesting combinations, like horizontal, like the 1958 Edsel, vertical, like the 1964 Pontiac, and diagonal, like the 1961 Chrysler. But I'm not entirely enthusiastic about this one. It's the early 1960s, and as I mentioned before, Europe was free to do what it wanted with its headlights, which led to a small revolution, the introduction of the rectangular, rectangular headlight. headlight. 
I know, quite shocking, and I wonder how the corporate briefing went. Gentlemen, we're not selling enough cars. What should we do? Ooh, ooh, ooh. yeah, that's bad. I don't even work here. Maybe we should fiddle around with our engines. Maybe we should make a new model. I know something. Here, this is what we know and love, right? But how about this? Give this man a goddamn promotion. The first cars to feature these square babies were the 1961 Citroën Ami 6 and the 1961 Ford Taunus P3, and later on, the 1965 Opel Record B. Now, I made some jokes about it, but it does look quite stylish, and matches the square and straight body lines of the car and finishes the modernist look. But the fun doesn't end there, because headlights in Europe were allowed to be placed behind and covered by glass. Sure, the headlights were still round, but inserted in a flowing form, like in the 1960 Jaguar E-Type, but more noticeably Citroën DS. The same thing cannot be said about the United States. Although dual headlights were allowed in 1958, headlights still had to be 7 inches and round. And that's why all the cars from the US in the 60s and the 70s still had round headlights. To at least get some fun out of this, or maybe it was out of pure shame, some manufacturers started to hide them. Hidden headlights became somewhat of a rage and were commonly found on sports cars like the Chevrolet Corvette, muscle cars like the Dodge Charger and luxury cars like the Lincoln Continental. US manufacturers also weren't allowed to place headlights behind glass, which led to the following interesting situation best explained by the Citroën SM. In Europe, the SM had a futuristic front end, entirely made out of glass and featured rectangular headlights. But when you wanted to import one to the US, the front end had to be converted to meet the regulations. In this case, sealed beam headlights. No glass cover was allowed and the headlights had to be replaced. Now, in itself, it doesn't look too bad, but when you know how the original setup looks like, then it starts to look a lot worse. Finally, in 1974, rectangular headlights were permitted, but still had to have a standard size. The new lamps were quickly adopted and for a short while stacked pairs were popular, like the 1977 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. But horizontal really was the way to go, like this 1978 Pontiac Bonneville. What followed were years of very boxy looking cars, amplified by the use of rectangular headlights, at least in the US. In Europe, cars were also boxy, but as mentioned before, headlights were allowed to be placed behind glass, leading to a more aerodynamic front end. And this had to change, and it was the Ford Motor Company that started complaining again to the US government. By 1984, after constant nagging, the US government granted permission for the use of <gasps> replaceable bulb, non-standard shape, architectural headlamps, or simply named Euro-style headlights. One of the first cars to adopt it was the 1984 Lincoln Mark 7. Finally, the US was up to par again with Europe. Or is it? European regulations for headlights eventually became an international standard, known as the World Forum of Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations. Now, this sounds rather complicated, but it's not. This means that almost every car maker over the world can rely on basic rules and regulations from the EU, which gives an easy and clear overview of what is allowed and what isn't. Except for one nation, you guessed it, the United States. The US is not part of this agreement and uses its own Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 108. Until this day, this leads to some subtle differences. For instance, EU laws require cars to have amber colored turn signals. The US does not. On the front end, the turning lights are white or orange, but on the rear end, turning lamps are still red in the US. This can lead to some confusion when a car is braking and turning at the same time. Anyway, from the 1980s, car lights were shaped according to the design trends it followed, being more oval and round in the 90s, but starting to become more angular and aggressive by the 2000s. In the meantime, a lot of development and improvement was going on inside the lights. For a long time, the industry standard were halogen lamps, but HID, high intensity discharge lamps, or better known as xenon lamps, became the new alternative in the 90s. 
The first car to have these was the second generation BMW 7 series, and these types of lights are still used today. Along HID lights came the light emitting diodes, better known as LED lights. LED lights were developed in the early 2000s and first found their way in the 2006 Lexus LS, but only as low beams. The first fully multifunctional LED headlights with intelligent low and high beam switching were available with the facelifted Audi A8 in 2013. The latest step in headlight technology are friggin' lasers. Lasers have the advantage to be almost as bright as LEDs, but only use half the power. Audi developed laser lights for the 24 hours of Le Mans, but it was BMW that put lasers into production with the 2014 BMW i8. Today, manufacturers are getting increasingly creative with their headlights. Because of the high level of technology, it allows them to shape the lights almost any way they want them and turn them into little pieces of art. I mean, take a look at the 2020 DS7 Crossback. When the car is starting up, the headlights do a little dance. I mean, how cool is that? Not to mention the taillights that look like they go to infinity and beyond. And beyond. And beyond. And beyond. And beyond. Okay. I've shed some light on automotive headlights and I hope you saw the light as I was delighted to have enlightened you with my bright knowledge. I think we can all agree that this episode was absolutely... No, 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 no. Lit. <laughs>